Greetings, everyone from Gamaragal land. Today, we all gather with the diverse First Nations peoples on the sacred land of Australia and pay our respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and their ancestors who have been custodians of this land for over 60,000 years. In our First Nations peoples, we recognize the longest living culture on earth and the people's continuing connection to these lands, waters and culture. We stand with First Nations sisters and brothers committed to working for equality and justice for all. Across the globe, we are in solidarity with all First Nations peoples and honor the people and their ancestors of the African continent today. And in particular, the Democratic Republic of Congo. We thank you globally for leading us in traditional and modern ways to continue to deal with the crisis facing us all, to care for Mother Earth. The snake has long been a traditional symbol in many cultures. The snake asks us to wake up the consciousness of the people in addressing this crisis of relationship between peoples and the lands they live on. Collective wisdom brings back nature to balance. Wake up the snake, build a coalition of hope. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Robin. And welcome to Peace Building in Practice, Africa and Beyond. Thank you all for joining today. I am tuning in from Daruk country where I live and it's really a beautiful country. And lately I've really been, uh, uh, felt very privileged to enjoy the trees and creeks as I take walks during the lockdown. And um, I respect the Daruk people who are the original owners of this land. And I thank them for their generosity from the bottom of my heart. Uh, so I'm Lydia Gitao and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UNSW, the Felt Experience and Empathy Lab. We call it Phil, in the School of Art and Design. And um, I'm currently involved in research amongst refugees, uh, developing creative engagement tools for mental health. I'm also an honorary associate at the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies, University of Sydney. So welcome, welcome all. And please remember to leave yourself on mute throughout the presentation, unless of course you're the one speaking. And uh, you can use the chat box throughout the whole event to communicate with others and the hosts during the presentations and also to ask questions. So today our discussion will be based on the book, The Frontlines of Peace, An Insider's Guide to Changing the World by Dr. Severin Otteser, who is a professor of political science at Columbia University and an award-winning author, researcher, and peace builder. Diane has just put the, the book, the, a copy, a, a screenshot of the book for us. And um, the book was launched in Australia on Wednesday, September 22nd, as part of this festival, uh, Racing Peace Festival. And uh, if you're there, the event was really fantastic. You will agree with me if you're there that uh, Severin really inspired us and uh, gave us that sense of hope uh, that it is possible to build peace even in the most violent conflict settings. I personally felt very, very encouraged uh, by that, by her presentation. And I believe uh, if, you, if you read the book, if you, uh, and if you missed that event and you, you'd like to view it, you can, uh, of course, go to the Race in Peace Festival website. That's after it concludes tomorrow, and you will be able to access the link there. Yeah, you will love it. And you can purchase the book at Glee Books in Sydney, as well as online. And reviews and media interviews are available on the author's website, which Diane has kindly put for us in the chat. Thanks, Diane. Now, this morning's event is co-hosted by Hada Kogo, 
the University of Sydney through the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies and the Great Lakes Agency for Peace and Development or GLAPID, we call it GLAPID. And all three organizations are actively involved both locally and globally in social development as well as advocacy. Diane has put the links of all those uh, organizations in the chat so you can, you can check them out at your time. And uh, now before we begin discussing the realities and implications of grassroots peace building, uh, let us hear from Roger Dayabaje. Roger is a spoken word poet who is originally from the DLC and who came to Australia as a refugee and now calls Australia home. So Diane, if you could play for us a performance by Roger, that would be great. Thanks, Diane. He is running, a poet, a soldier, a slave. His words are locked in chains, guarded by inhumane atrocity. Trying to leave the strife life behind, searching for peace. Searching for freedom to resurrect his heart again. Freedom so he can remember how to be. Tis for ink, his words are blurry, stuttering, no one hears his voice, chest heavy with sorrows, the grip of faith in God, humanity and self is weakened. Through these treacherous passageways infected by morbid and carnage, the sages of survival are relentlessly struggling to find shelter, but we push on. This journey strips men of their masculinity. They crawl in dirt with dust in their eyes. Children forced to men before they are taught to stand. This path of humanity is a raft of agony. Our tapestry tells a story in poetry Sometimes it's a mystery because they define our characters by the misery of our question marked continent. But we are not our circumstances. So don't hate us, don't fear us, for we are not terrorists or rebels in armed militia. We're not gangsters or witch doctors, although we possess magic in us. Our melanin does not equate to anger, laziness, and violence. We are scared. Scared to lose another daughter, another son. Not ready to die yet. We are bruised, broken, and confused. We miss home. We are just like you. Thank you, thank you, Diane, for that. And thanks to Roger for that very inspiring piece. Uh, Roger is a great example of many refugees and immigrants in, in Australia who are making significant contributions to the arts. We have quite a number of them, and we are really lucky to have Roger and others in the country. Uh, thank you. And you can, you can see, you can watch other presentations by Roger from his, uh, from the, his channel. YouTube channel, uh, Diane has put uh, the, that, the link in the chat. Thanks, Diane. Um, now we, we had wanted to play for you um, an excerpt from Severin's uh, interview. Um, Diane, if it's possible, we can play that. Uh, no worries, you can actually watch 
Uh, Diane has put um, Severin's website in the chat. You can watch a bit of that, um, a bit of the presentations from her book. And of course, if you're able, you can get the copy yourself. And it's just so inspiring uh, in that book how um, Severin breaks down for us the bottom-up peace building approach and helps us to see peace as something realistic, something pragmatic, attainable. Uh, and there's so much in her book that uh, demonstrates these methods, illustrates them very clearly for us. So I will just encourage you to go to her website and to go even to some of those presentations that she has made concerning her book, but most of all to read the book. It's fantastic, very, very encouraging and inspiring stories there. And of course, we would like to bring this home and discuss how the methods apply in our own contexts. So we are lucky to have a number of panelists with us who are going to guide us through this. And all of them are physicians. They, they, are, they have international experience, including from Africa. We are very lucky to have, um, I will introduce them to you. And please, as we go, remember to write any questions you may have in the chat box and we will address them towards the end. So I'll introduce our panelists now. We have, first of all, Dr. Megan Cox. Dr. Megan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Megan. Uh, Dr. Megan is a senior lecturer in public health at the University of Sydney. And she has the experience of living and working for eight years in Africa, developing the first medical specialist for Botswana. And now she helps train and teach students interested in becoming global health practitioners. Uh, welcome, Dr. Megan. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Nadine Shema. Dr. Nadine is a co-founder of the Great Lakes Agency for Peace and Development International, GLAPID. And she serves as the agency's settlement operations manager and public relations officer. Dr. Nadine is of Rwandan origin, but she lived for many years in the DLC and was trained as a medical doctor in Rwanda. And here in Australia, she is a public health professional and a refugee advocate. Welcome, Dr. Nadine. Thank you very much. <laughs> then we have Dr. Vera Sisternik. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vera. Uh, she is a specialist in emergency medicine and a former research associate at the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And uh, she has previously worked as a health policy advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. Vera is working with Hadap Kogo to build an emergency medicine education project in the DLC. Welcome, Dr. Vera. Thank you, Lydia. And I'm really lucky as moderator, I get to start off the questions. And I will start with you, Dr. Megan. Uh, so as a person with experience training medical specialists in Botswana and other countries, and now training students here in Australia to become global health practitioners, what insights do you draw from Severin's book on how best to avoid a top-down, quite severe approach in the field of public mm -hmm. health and how to develop grassroots-led uh, partnerships? Dr. Megan. Thanks, Lydia. Um, I think that was one of the crucial and very interesting things I learned from the book was, as, in, as she said, it's very important to avoid that top-down approach in, in peace building. And this is also very crucial to avoid as a healthcare worker when you're working in someone else's culture. So in, when that happens in healthcare work, unfortunately, as you said, it's often referred to as the white savior complex because it's common in healthcare workers uh, from high income countries when they go to somewhere such as Africa. So I think it's a complex 
thing to discuss, but I think the first thing to acknowledge and recognise is that as highly trained professionals in Australia and in other developed countries, we have a lot of privilege. We've been given a lot of opportunities and we've been trained in a particular healthcare culture in our own settings. Um, and these aren't bad, but they do get in the way of us developing culturally appropriate and sustainable and locally led solutions. Because as we've, we're trained, we're trained to think up of looking at solutions and doing things in our own way. So I think that's one of the hardest things is actually to get people to acknowledge that. And then once you've acknowledged that, then you can start to um, critique it and work for local with a, with a different outlook. Mm -hmm. The other, the second thing I, I guess it I was to highlight is to think of it as a partnership when you're going to work, not as a specialist coming in, uh, you know, offering solutions, but as a partnership. And so in any partnership, as, as Severin said, you need a community. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a community of locally respected healthcare leaders where you're working, who are aware of the health system, of the health issues and of very importantly of the cultural sensitivities and you need to link in with these leaders and get um, provide them with a vision together and this means that then the community can can be um, benefited from both ways from the local and from the international as perspectives and then you can build up from a grassroots level that would be my sort of basic take on on that question. It's a very complicated question, but I hope that answered it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Megan. Indeed, you have answered it. And uh, <laughs> especially when you talk about the need for flexibility, the need for, um, you know, building partnerships, despite mm -hmm. what you may have been trained as maybe uh, in the, like in the Western country, going mm -hmm. there with that hubble, flexible attitude and wanting to partner with the with the local communities. I think you have yep. you have said it. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mega. Thank you. So we have um, I have the next question I'm going to ask you, Dr. Nadine, uh, with your experience as a co-founder of the Great Lakes Agency for Peace and Development, that's GLAPID, and a refugee advocate who has been working with communities from the Great Lakes region of Africa here in Australia to build peace. How do you find Severin's book informing the contribution the African diaspora can make in peace building? You have a lot of experience in this area, even personal experience, um, your own experiences, Dr. Nadine. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Lydia, for your question. Um, <clears throat> sorry. As just Megan said, and as uh, Lydia just mentioned, Severin's book is very, very inspirational, very insightful, and um, it, it really shows us uh, a big part that has been missing, especially in peace building. Um, many efforts are being you know, performed, done by the government, especially as Megan said, the top bottom uh, kind of approach. But Severin's books showed us that uh, the other way, the bottom up uh, approach is more efficient and it's more, more actually even less costly and also more sustainable. So I'm going to talk as um, a refugee advocate as well as a co-founder of an organization that works with mainly refugees from the Great Lakes uh, region of Africa. So for those who don't know, that region has been characterized by uh, wars and conflict and ongoing instability and political troubles for, for decades. So, and I also thank Roger for his poem because he illustrates exactly the kind of people who come here and the kind of people that we work with here in Australia, especially in my organization. Mm -hmm. So those people are people who come with a, uh, very big load of trauma. They've been bruised. They've been, all they know is, is war and pain and poverty and misery. Um, so when they come here in Australia, it's of course, all the efforts are done to, to welcome them, to support them, to, you know, give them all um, 
the support they need, I would say materially, financially, um, you know, everything that is really tangible, of course, which will kind of respond to most of the issues that they had. But the bottom, like the, the key area which has been affected, which is like their life, their mental health, their mind has been spoiled. So I always think that the approach that uh, Severin is suggesting in her book is to go bottom up, get them involved, you know, talk to them, listen to them, um, try to heal the wounds, okay? And try to, 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 okay, even to help them also understand what they went through because most of them have developed um, massive mental health issues so that even though they can receive all the privileges or all the opportunities that are, are given to them when they come to Australia, most of them don't enjoy them. Most of them don't use them. Most of them don't even think it's even that what they want, you know? So in my organization, we're doing like um, different programs and projects to try to get them involved, get them, you know, come and talk and share. And as Severin's book says, most of the time, the issues that these people have it's something which is deep, deep inside. Something sometimes which is even in, uh, generational. Some kids even are born with that. Their parents were refugees. They were in refugee camps. They were born in refugee camps. The only thing they know is that. So they've never seen anything good. And that's why most of the time you always see stories about, oh, this person from refugee background, this, 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 this criminal, you know, youth. Uh, being in gangs it's not like <laughs> that's what they know so that's why we need the support of everyone and especially working with these people trying to understand them trying to heal with them trying to you know otherwise we'll find out that all the resources which are being you know placed there for them are not really used um, efficiently and uh, I don't know if I have to talk I'll talk for the whole day but with the love that we show them, the kindness that we show them, the money that we give them, the opportunities that we give them, let's also go down and try to understand them, sometimes even understand their reaction and don't judge, don't blame, work with them. And you know, together we will, try, we will manage to build peace together with them involved, not doing it for them, but doing it with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. You've actually touched an area that I'm very interested in, the whole idea of the link between trauma healing and peace building. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, we cannot talk about peace building if people are not working towards their own healing. So thank you. And I know you've, say, you've, you've said um, you've been talking about them them quite a bit but i know you also <laughs> mean yourself yes you know, yeah. <laughs> myself but, too <laughs> yeah I, yeah i know you're also talking about yourself i know yeah. you're talking about us i'm so just all, saying people coming yeah. to this country i'm more talking like people yeah. here in australia yeah yeah mm -hmm. so definitely that and uh, actually like you said to see what um, contributions refugees, even people who have gone through trauma in that manner are contributing, yeah. for example, Roger, and mm. talking about, you know, what he has been through and now where he is. Uh, not forgetting the journey, but making something out of what he has uh, gone through. It's really beautiful. Definitely. So, Roger, yeah. you should understand, you should hear his story. It's very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. And just yeah. also talking from your own experience, really appreciate that. And you're welcome, everyone. You're welcome to put comments in the chat as we go. Um, questions and also comments, because I'm, I'm sure these are things that we are all engaging with and would like to maybe even improve in or continue with. So yeah, welcome to do that. So my next question is to you, Dr. Vera. 
as a specialist in emergency medicine and working to build an emergency medicine education project in DLC, how would you evaluate your success in this project? And how do you find Severin's book speaking to the realities you experience as you go on with this project? Dr. Vera. Thank you, Lydia. Um, and thank you for the very interesting question. I'll just preface uh, by maybe explaining to the audience that um, I work with a small NGO called Hand Up Congo, the co-founder of which Lucy Hobgood Brown is also here. And um, Lucy's inspiration, I think, comes fundamentally out of one of love. Uh, she spent her childhood in the Congo. Mm. And I think that's profoundly important, actually, because when you do something out of love or compassion, uh, compared with one out of power, the path and your outcomes are profoundly different. So when I first met Lucy, and, um, and she, in conversation, found that I was a emergency medicine uh, professional. She said, well, I've been working in the Congo for so long doing community um, building and so on. Uh, I've never had an opportunity to do something medical. Would you like to come to the Congo and, um, and do something medical? I said, uh, well, Lucy, you know, um, I know nothing about the Congo. Uh, I speak enthusiastic, but lousy French. I have uh, no idea about the health system. It is very, very far for me to come to teach anyone anything. And in fact, my experience directly before meeting Lucy was I was working for the International Committee of the Red Cross, mm. which like the World Health Organization, United Nations and so on, are one of these sort of mega uh, institutions and mega global bureaucracies and they are 60, 70 years old. And they are profoundly important. And I'll come back to what I think Severine says about them. Uh, but I found personally a certain frustration because like moving a large vessel, it takes a long, long time to really do anything sometimes from these top-down channels. And they have very clear uh, hierarchies of power mm -hmm. and predefined mm -hmm. concepts as well, and they're not particularly nimble. And if you want to do anything outside the defined protocol, it's extremely difficult. And you have to spend a lifetime there uh, uh, through and, and try to create transformation and change before it can be implemented. So when um, I came across Hand Up Congo, I thought what a wonderful opportunity to do something grassroots, to try a different methodology. And this was, I had never read, well, Severine's book wasn't even written then. And I hadn't really come across Severine at all and her amazing work, which I am subsequently ashamed of because she is a real uh, name and, um, and has really caused transformation in the humanitarian world. And so I thought, okay, let's do something nimble and grassroots. So we went to the Congo and the first thing was uh, weeks of travel and listening, listening mm -hmm. and observing and asking what the local population wanted. The way we practice emergency medicine here in Australia is a very high resource, a very um, sophisticated um, uh, uh, machinery that is dependent on many things, including the successful rule of law, successful taxation within the country, and, uh, and a system that basically works. Now, the, con uh, the, the, uh, the Congo context is, is comp completely different. So we went and we observed, and most importantly, um, we then asked the local population, what is it that you want? What is it that you imagine? What is the reality that you would like in terms of your healthcare service? So like Severine, whose thesis, I think, um, is that she advocates for listening above all uh, to, to the local population and using what they want, including their local resources and, uh, and, and growing the projects that would be most pertinent to them. But at the same time, she doesn't say that the large global institutions are rubbish and corrupt and useless. She doesn't say that. She says that they have a very uh, powerful and very important role 
is that uh, they do have standards and norms and global prestige. People do stop and listen to them. So it is important to have the two join up. So part of our uh, mission at Handup Congo was also con to connect the grassroots with the international population. Is it important that if you're going to create an emergency education project, that it doesn't exist in the bubble of Africa? Mm. You have to dignify the professionals there to bring them along, to participate in global standards, to help form them, help implement them, and help have them join the family of emergency physicians around the world, help them build a national um, a committee or a, or, a, or a national platform or forum um, that, that uh, tries to move and, and do things on a national level, and then to also have an international voice, because then that's how you try to um, uh, uh, influence the community as well globally. So what I found during this, this work and why I was so happy to come across um, Severine's book yeah. is that she has distilled in a very articulate and scholarly way, yeah. something that I have lived experientially, I think is absolutely true in the reality that I have seen. Um, and also what we have striven to do is to connect the grassroots with the global, which is something that Severin says is very useful to do strategically, which I think we did try to do. So that's a very long way around, Lydia, to uh, get to your question of what is our measure of success? One, I think there are objective measures. Um, we is an is a emergency medicine education project. Fundamentally, education should result in the better health of, of a nation. But we're a very small NGO, so we dare not call it the emergency medicine project, because then we have to measure outcomes, which are saving, which, which is fundamentally saving lives through emergency medicine. So we are very small and we don't have that many resources. So I tried to temper the ambition and called it the Emergency Medicine Education Project. You can, uh, you can measure that because uh, uh, accountability is a very important thing. You can measure that objectively by pre and post training um, surveys or little examinations and, and so on. So uh, which is what we aim to do. On a slightly more ambitious level, we uh, want emergency medicine to be a recognized uh, entity in, in the Congo. And we want the DRC to have a seat at the table of the international emergency medicine community. We want emergency medicine to be part of the national medical curriculum. And so that's from a substantive point of view. From my personal uh, point of view, the measure of success of Hand Up Congo is ultimately the disappearance of the need for us. I aim to disappear from the project and as fast as possible um, because that means it's a success and that means it doesn't need people from the outside and it means they are successful and sustainable and they can grow something that is truly useful and and fruit of the Congo. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vera. Uh, very, very interesting and I love the the commitment, which is actually coming through as you, as you talk, uh, the commitment to make this actually work. And uh, I think it's still going back to the same uh, things that Dr. Nadine and Dr. Megan has talked about, the idea of partnerships, the idea of approaching uh, the, the local communities with humility and wanting to build relationships, wanting to understand what they want. And um, ultimately, like you've said, leaving them, trusting them, respecting that what they have can actually work and they are able to, to do it. So um, yeah, very great. And the way you, you talked about um, coming across Severin's work, which distills your realities is very interesting how sometimes you're involved in this and then you get someone like Severin putting it together so well, so clearly. And, and, and then also kind of giving us a roadmap for what needs to be done. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vera, for, for that. Now we have, I know we have a number of questions and, um, and comments in the chat, and you're welcome to continue writing those. We will come uh, to them at the end. I have another question for our panelists, which um, this question was actually posed to uh, Dr. Severin on Wednesday when she was launching the book and uh, she answered it 
but I would also like to ask you for your answer to the question. How do you answer the question, what is peace building? I remember James, I think it was James Fox who asked this question to uh, Severin. How do you answer the question, what is peace building? What is peace building to you? It, is, it seems to be understood so differently by different people, but what does it mean to you? Dr. Megan, maybe we start with you. Um, thank you, Livia. Well, uh, I have worked with a number of NGOs, including um, Medicines on Frontier, so Dr. That Borders, and lived in a, in, within a war situation when I was working there. And so I think um, it's, it's difficult to understand what peace is, I think, until you've lived somewhere where there isn't peace, mm -hmm. and then you, you really appreciate what peacefulness is. Um, and I, I, I guess trying to describe peace building the process, it's a continual cycle. So it's, it's building, it doesn't stop. It's, it's building, um, it's very importantly as um, Severin, I mean, as we've all said actually, Nadine and Vera, it's listening. It's listening, it's learning more about each other. Um, it's a two way process. It's understanding each other's values, each other's cultural aspects and trying to find common ground um, because there will be common ground. I, I, as um, Roger said in his, his um, performance, we're just like each other. We're just like, I'm just like you. Uh, it's, so it's walking together, it's supporting each other. Um, but I think real peace, be, re, real peace building is actually very difficult because it's often putting some other people's needs in front of your own. So it's it's love, as um, as Vera said. So that's sometimes one of the most hardest. It's very hard to do that. But I think that's long lasting and real peace building. Those things. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Megan. Love and uh, common ground, understanding. <laughs> thank you. And like you said, um, it's di it's different for like you have found different places, you have found people defining peace differently. So, yeah, depending on their experiences. How about you, Dr. Nadine? Um, for me, peace building. Um, I'm going to explain it like in kind of a a, a metaphor. So it's like it's a, like a building, like a like a house, like a wall. Mm -hmm. So you will always need uh, building blocks to build your, your wall. And every single person is, 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 is a block, isn't it? And we need to make sure that every block is, is uh, strong enough. Is, um, he has all the, the power to support each other as you, you build. And of course, if some of the blocks are not strong enough, they can make the old buildings stumble or, you know, not really <laughs> strong. So that's which means like every single person before building peace, every single person has to have peace with them, in them first of all. And that's why we have to work together to make sure all of us have that peace so that when we build that wall, there won't be some who will make the wall fall. Yes. So it's an individual, uh, it's an individual effort, but also it's a collective effort if you want to do it together. Mm -hmm. So which means I'm coming back again to my first answer when I said some of the blocks, it's very easy because for them, they have all it takes to be strong and, you know, and, and um, strong enough to, you know, to maintain the building. But some of the blocks are weak because of all the background and the issues I spoke about. But if they are supported enough, they can also become strong so that all together we can build the wall. And of course, in the building, you'll need some engineers, some, you know, those who have the skills, mm -hmm. uh, that's why, what uh, uh, Megan said, we, we, we all need all those other approach, you know, but the individual ones are also as important as, imagine if the engineer has all the skills to build the house, but he's not using the right blocks to build his house. 
it's Istanbul, isn't it? So it's a it's it's a community effort. It's a global effort. It's also an individual effort. Mm -hmm. Yes, and mm -hmm. of course with love and kindness and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and compassion, it will yeah. be possible. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely, yeah. The same, th those same principles that Dr. Megan talked about, and I love the idea, the the metaphor of a building. It's actually yes. something we are building. Mm. Lovely. Thank you, Dr. Nadine. How about you, Dr. Vera? How do you define peace building? Yes, it's quite a fundamental question, isn't it? Considering we're at a peace building festival, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I, I think uh, peace to me are the conditions under which or in which humans can thrive in all their ways. So physical, uh, economic, and spiritual or cultural. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly we need to add to that uh, the environment in which we live is also allowed to thrive because that is coming to an absolute crisis point for us on, on, on this planet. So we can see whether it's in our own families, in our place of work, in our countries, whether there are aspects of these places that do not allow for the individuals within it to thrive. Now, Nadine has touched on uh, an extreme experience of the refugee uh, uh, population, yeah. where fear for your, for your very physical well-being is a daily consideration. And that, I think, is an extraordinary uh, uh, burden um, to have to live with every single day if we really sit and contemplate that. And mixed in with that would be economic trauma, the lack of ability to thrive economically, not be rewarded for work. I have seen in the Congo how effort does not equal reward. And mm -hmm. conversely, a lot of terrible behavior is rewarded enormously because of the lack of systems of accountability and uh, and also spiritually you know culturally for people to thrive and sometimes i you know i think i think of star wars bear with me here <laughs> you know when when you have these sort of intergalactic um uh, uh, uh meetings and so on and all these people look at each other and seem very different sometimes i think we have that here here on planet earth you know we, we have peoples from everywhere. And sometimes we tell ourselves that we're all so different. And mm -hmm. actually, is actually we're, we're just, it's different ways of being human. We're mm -hmm. all a little bit of an expression of the incredible spectrum of what it is to be human. And we all want the same thing, as Roger says. We, we, we all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we all need the same conditions under which we can, we can thrive. And as I, as I thought about um, peace, you know, I thought, well, what, what's maybe the correlation? I was thinking, if we look where there are uh, peaceful countries or peaceful communities or peaceful um, environments, what, what's the sort of common denominator there? Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if you look at the outcome, it makes the definition a bit easier to, to form. And I think uh, in general, communities that have a truth or a truth-based reality. And I think that's increasingly important. If you look at the Congo or you look at uh, conflict areas, quite often the reality that is created for people is not based on truth, is not based on um, uh, 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 an authentic reading of a situation, is based on contrived stories and political narratives that are not truthful. And I think the, the, the more we can pertain to reality and overlay that with respect of a culture of respect of the human person and the dignity of the individual, I think these two things together are a good recipe for peace. And if we in ourselves and what we do can promote that, a truth-based reality overlaid with respect of the human person, I think that's a good soil on which to grow peace. Mm. Mm. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vera. Truth-based reality. <laughs> Love it. It was very interesting to hear um, Severine's answer to this. And she, she was um, describing peace and uh, uh, defining peace, basically. And she said, uh, she talked about this story of the person, the, I think it's, um, yeah, from Colombia who said, 
peace to them is I can that she can sleep in her pajamas. Very interesting that uh, at that time, because she can actually, she didn't have to prepare to flee in the night so she could sleep in her pajamas. So just that basic, you know, the same things that you're talking of, the basic, what do people really want? And uh, I also remembered uh, when I was doing my research at Kakuma refugee camp, a woman telling me uh, that peace, I asked, what is peace to you? And she said, peace is you, peace is you who has come to visit me. You know, the idea of someone just visiting and sitting with her, to her that was peace. So the same idea of finding out to, uh, with the people that we are working with, what is peace to them and working with that. So thank you very much uh, for that. And um, now we will have some questions from the audience. So I have a few questions already coming through. Hopefully we will be able to answer as many as possible before our time is over. Uh, the first question is from Olivia. Uh, she asks, it's interesting that the panelists are mainly public health professionals. To what extent is there significant link between public health and peace building? A link between public health and peace building. Dr. Megan, would you like to comment on that link between public health and peace building, please? I think uh, public health has come into people's forefront more with this COVID era that everybody knows a bit about what public health specialists do. And the main thing that they do is that they are a whole of community approach specialists. So they're interested in the whole community as well as the whole person. Mm -hmm. So they're interested from the birth to death experience, all the features of life. They're interested in your working experience, your leisure experience. They're interested in you on where, whatever um, socioeconomic state, status you are because they are looking at the whole community. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in COVID that these public health um, measures have influenced every part of our lives and are aiming to influence every part of the community. And I guess that's the, one of the link is that you can't have real peace unless you've involved the whole community. And yeah. on the other way that they, because they are looking at the whole community approach, then they have an, uh, be able to identify peaceful solutions or issues that are involving the community that could be lead, leading to conflict. But yeah, I'd, I'd, um, I don't think I'd really thought of it like that before. In medicine, it's quite common in Australia for people to um, practice medicine in the university and then have maybe a year or two in the hospital system and then start specialising in one particular area. And so they kind of, in some ways, they lose that community, mm. that whole person perspective, unless they go into general practice, which is crucial, but also just involves a particular segment of the community. Um, yeah, so I think public health is is a, a one of those areas that allows you to think uh, about your community and think more about peace and globally even. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Megan. Of course, uh, peace building actually branches out to various other fields mm -hmm. and uh, medicine and public health is just one of them. Uh, so it happens yeah. that our focus today is uh, public health. Thank you for that connection. Now, I have another question um, from Tara. Uh, how do you ensure bottom-up approaches are actually led by local actors when international fathers and international actors set agendas and targets for most humanitarian and peace-building interventions? I will ask you, Vera, Dr. Vera, to uh, respond to that question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tara. Um, I think that is a very important, that's a very important question. You know, how, how do you ensure that? I suppose there are a couple of ways to do that. One is if you don't uh, involve from the outset the top-down organizations in the first place. So I think that's certainly what we did in Hand Up Congo. It was a very deliberate act. 
to uh, just go very grassroots. And because then the direction of the project is not skewed. Uh, because fundamentally, if you try to do a grassroots project that is funded by um, a large organization that has its particular agenda, knowingly or unknowingly, or a particular sort of um, uh, uh, performance mm -hmm. indicator, then I think that would be very, very difficult to do. Uh, and, um, and I think using uh, philanthropic organizations sometimes gives you a greater freedom, not always, because some of them do push their own power and glory um, as, as well. And, um, and I think it just has to be very particular and strategic, I think. Mm -hmm. With Hand Up Congo, we started off uh, grassroots and not involving uh, the, the international players. But then there comes a point where it's strategically very, very useful. So everybody across Africa has heard of the World Health Organization. Yeah. So you can do your sort of little education uh, programs and, and so on. But if at some point you go, oh, right, you know, we now have a certificate that is endorsed uh, by the uh, World Health Organization, that gives it particular power. So you can create your grassroots things and then strategically pick from the big players and plant them into your oasis. But you just have to do that very consciously. And at each point, consider whether or not that is going to skew your particular trajectory. So I think the fact that you've asked the question already shows that you've got insight into the issues. And if you just look at that and define what you want and choose carefully, then I think it's very possible. Thanks. And maybe a follow up question to that, Dr. Vera. Um, how do you promote a culture of accountability as you're doing as you're doing these partnerships? Yes, I think it's, it is twofold. I think um, one is the accountability of ourselves that we say what we're going to do and we hold ourselves accountable. So at Hand Up Congo, we have committee meetings and so on, um, and uh, uh, that we question ourselves and things like funding. You know, are we accountable to our donors? We want to be completely transparent and say that the money that they've given us has gone where it's going, and we're very careful there. In terms of promoting on the ground accountability, I think the fundamental thing is finding true local champions. Mm. That's often said, but what I mean is this, is that I'm sure a lot of you have been in projects or done things that somehow you want the outcome even more than the local population. Sometimes I ask myself, why is it that I want something more than the local population, which is the one that's suffering or the one that is not getting the health outcomes that they deserve and they could have, actually. Mm -hmm. And every time that happens, you know, I sit down and I say to Lucy and the other committee members, look, this is a little litmus test. Anytime you some want something more than the people, I think there's a problem there. And this goes back to Megan's, you know, um, white savior complex. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs saving. It's just that if you want something more than the local population, you haven't listened or you mm -hmm. haven't defined a need that they see and agree with. Mm -hmm. And I think finding local champions that want something, not as much as you, but more than you, because they love their country and their own people and they care about it and they have to live there mm -hmm. is key and to keep redefining that. And once you do, sometimes... Uh, certain communities or populations, they don't really understand what accountability is mm -hmm. uh, because either they've never seen it. How do you know something that you haven't seen? Mm -hmm. Or they don't understand the, um, the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we, who mm -hmm. come from places that do experience accountability, can share the mechanisms of accountability including not only the stick approach of get people to um, be transparent about their funding, what they've done, you know, the outcomes and so on, but also allow your champions to wear the glory. Mm -hmm. Give it to them. You don't need it. If they achieve something, they will become increasingly accountable if they get the respect mm -hmm. and the credit and people begin to look to them and, um, mm -hmm. and, and they need that. And as much as, you know, you can keep out of it uh, and, and just sort of work from the shadows, I think that's the, 
for us anyway, it, it's been a very fruitful and and uh, and and good way mm -hmm. to to ensure that. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you. Local heroes. I love that. And, and, we, and letting them wear the glory. Lovely. Thank you, Dr. Vera. Um, I'll ask this question and then any of you can answer, depending on what insight you may have. Um, it's a question again from Tara. She mm -hmm. asks, what are effective peace building approaches in areas where people face extreme climate change related mm -hmm. challenges and conflict? Related to challenges and conflict where people face extreme climate change related to the conflict. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Uh, and then no one else can answer if you, you can just unmute yourself and answer. Anyone would like to comment on the relationship between conflict, peace building, and climate change? Uh, I'm certainly no climate change expert, but I suppose um, continuing on from before, you know, it, climate change often doesn't allow those conditions for individual, you know physical and economic thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have resource conflicts from of water or your crops get washed away or your property gets burnt down, I think is, and, and people have to move and uh, have climate change refugees. Uh, and then people have to accept other people coming in, share their resources and so on. And um, in regions where uh, there could have been underlying cultural differences I think all of this is 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 very very difficult. It can happen in the very sort of local sense of people literally moving over the border, but on an international sense as well. If you look at countries um, that might need a soybean crop mm -hmm. grown overseas to feed their own pig population, or you know to, to to grow pork for their own countries, and the geopolitical strategy of um, buying up uh, 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 farms or resources and so on, uh, that can itself create certain um, conflicts too, that are not just as simple as people running away from, from, their, from their land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a massive challenge for us. Yeah. Uh, and, and we will see it come more and more to the fore, I think, over the next decades. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, I, I know our time is going <laughs> quite fast and we may not be able to answer all the questions that are coming through. Uh, we, I will ask you uh, one question, maybe in a sense to summarize your thoughts and to um, maybe give some closing uh, thoughts that are coming to your mind as we, as, as we conclude. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is to each one of you. Uh, as we conclude, perhaps someone is thinking, what's my part in this? What can I contribute to make peace a reality? And uh, what is one thing that you would say to them drawing from Severin's book or even your own thoughts? Uh, we can start with you, Dr. Nadine, maybe. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think um, my contribution, and I believe it could be a contribution of anyone who is here today and to be part of this uh, session, it means that we are all striving for peace and to contribute to build peace in where we live or in this country with the people we live with. So I'll say that as my contribution is to especially ensure that everyone, mm -hmm. everyone who I work with because I work in the setting where I work with those refugees. My everyday work is to support them in the mm -hmm. settlement as much mm -hmm. I will support them, you know, to get an employment, to get, you know, uh, other needs that they have. But I also have to make sure they are happy, they are peaceful, they have managed to uh, overcome all the, the, the challenges and the, you know, 
the trauma that they have and and support them in that as well and listen to them especially mm -hmm. i'm gonna emphasize on the listening because i learned that through listening and through talking to the people or to the person you learn a lot about them and you also help them discover themselves especially mm -hmm. they can also discover the the issues and the weaknesses by talking and by being listened to mm -hmm. and also it also heals and also help them if a uh, professional um support is needed uh, support them as well to access that mm -hmm. and as i said in the metaphor let's make sure all of us are strong blocks yeah. so yeah. that together we can build that strong wall which is peace thank you very much thank you thank you dr nadine You're how welcome. about you dr megan what would you say as we come to an end some closing uh, thoughts I, yeah i guess i get asked a lot from junior healthcare workers about how they can make a difference, especially um, they really want to work internationally. And I say to them first, start locally, look at where you are and there's lots of opportunities. Um, I'm sure Nadine would agree. There's lots of opportunities in Australia to reach out and work with people that are, haven't got the same privileges as you. And not only to work, but just to listen, to listen and to learn from them. And then the other important thing is mentorship. So this is not a solo endeavor. So it's not you going out and changing the world. It's a it's a kind of it's a collaboration. It's a it's a building. It's like an engineering type process. So look for role models. Look for mentors locally and internationally and be guided by them in this that's sort of my take home messages for people when I get asked about working internationally thank you Dr Megan how about you Dr Vera well I agree totally with uh, what Nadine and Megan have said I think it's to um, to look around our, ourselves And I think, as Megan says, um, start small, because I think quite often in the humanitarian or public health world, people want to save the world, but don't care about their neighbors. Yeah. I think it's totally inauthentic. Yeah. Mm. We, I think we have to, um, almost, almost like a rainbow, you know, mm. start, start at, the, at, at the base of it. And I think to be a true peace builder uh, is at every opportunity where there's something that is not truth-based and not overlaid with understanding and compassion, whether it's just a comment that you hear, that you stand up for, to a, a community that you want to uh, transform, um, or another reality you want to help others imagine, I think it has to, uh, for it to be truly successful, has to be authentic. So it doesn't matter how small it is, but I don't think we can aim to build peace around the planet when we do very little in our immediate environment. So I would say nothing is too small and it's profoundly important mm -hmm. if everybody takes care of their own backyard, you know, that um, it, it, we, that has a, a, an incredibly rippling impact that is not to be underestimated. Yeah, thank you. And actually, Severin does have a section on the home front. She talks about uh, building peace in the home front. And like you're saying, it's sometimes easier to think, you know, of world challenges in the whole, in the area of peace building and forget that we need to start from literally our homes and our environment, our, our nearby environment. So, yeah, so right. Thank you. Thank you for that. And on climate change, uh, there are a few comments coming through. Uh, there, there's actually a session. James says that there are two sessions. There were two sessions on Friday, um, which you can revisit, of course, after the festival is over uh, regarding climate, climate change. It's a whole area and very much related to peace building. So if you would like to, uh, some two sessions yesterday while focusing on that. 
you can revisit those. And um, uh, Peter says climate change impacts mainly show in disasters, whether events as well as agriculture no longer working. This building in these situations is mainly about community resilience, mutual support, and then advocacy for action on climate change. So again, great insights there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, James. And you can go to the chat for a few more um, links and uh, ideas on this. So we are coming towards the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, our panelists, for your very insightful sharing. We really appreciate that. Now, a reminder that the book is available at Glee Books in Sydney or from Severin's website. And you can, um, actually, if you order at her website, you can get it at 30% off. Wow. Uh, Diane has put the the link in the chat. Also, please check out the websites of our hosts for this event, Hadap Kogo, the University of Sydney, uh, that is the uh, Department of Peace and Conflict Studies, and Great Lakes Agency for Peace and Development. We call it GLAPID. <laughs> they are very fondly known as GLAPID. And um, now we will hear a beautiful song of dance giving from the Omari sisters, Jemima and Miriam. Uh, Diane will play for us from their YouTube channel. So Diane, over to you, enjoy. Hey guys, my name is Merve Omari. I am the brother of Miriam and Jemima Omari. We are originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, we lived in Malawi for eight years as refugees and this song that you're about to listen to has symbolized so many things for us. At one time the song symbolized hope, strength and, and endurance. But now as you're about to hear it, it has a whole new meaning. This song has carried us through the years. The eight years in refugee camp were not, were not easy. There was ups and there was downs. I think Right now, with the current climate of the world, I think that one thing that we need is unity. Unity in our mind, unity in our hearts. One thing I'll know is that there is hope for people. There is hope for the world. The world doesn't know color. The world doesn't know race. The world is made up of one human family. And I believe if that human family can unite together, you too can be singing the song with us. This song talks about the gratefulness that we have, the joy that we have, and the hope that we find in our God. So as you sit back and listen to this song, I really hope it encourages you. I hope it challenges you. But I, most importantly, I hope it builds you up to create unity within our communities. Enjoy and God bless you. It's 
נמצאים בסיפה זכור, בלהיות Thank you. Thank you to the Obadi sisters, the beautiful Jemima and Miriam. Uh, they are also from the DRC originally, and uh, they came to Australia as refugees some years ago. Um, they actually lived in Malawi refugee camp for quite some time, like uh, the brother has said. Um, Jemima was born in Malawi, actually. And it's so, so lovely to hear them uh, sing for us today. And they have very many other songs in their YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Diane has put the, their channel on the, on, the, on the chat and you can, you can subscribe, you can like, you can listen to their beautiful music. Thank you so much to the sisters, Omari sisters. And uh, we want to thank you all around the world and in Australia for joining us today. Tuko Pamoja, that is Swahili for we are together. And I believe there is so much more we can accomplish in building peace together from the bottom up. Now we will do some online visiting. If you're comfortable, you can put on your video and uh, you can go to the view at the right uh, hand side, the top right hand side and put gal gallery so that you can see maybe your face and faces of friends, uh, old and new friends. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually this is what Ubuntu looks like. Ubuntu is a South African word that stands for the virtues of compassion and humanity, the same virtues that um, Jemima and, and uh, Miriam's, Miriam's brother was talking about, compassion, humanity, unity. And indeed this event and the entire Racing Peace Festival is about those virtues, compassion and humanity and unity. So uh, if you can unmute yourself, if that you're okay with unmuting yourself, let us all say Ubuntu, 
together. So just unmute yourself and say Ubuntu. 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 Yeah, I know there are, it's, uh, we have different frequencies, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful way to conclude. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. And don't forget you can view and share a recording of this event when the festival is over tomorrow. Just go to the Racing Peace Festival website and also remember to register for the informal gathering tomorrow. We have the cocktail hour at 3.30 p.m. So register for that. And uh, also, if you would like to, you can donate to Racing Peace via the link that uh, Diane has put in the chat. In the chat. Um, and um, thank you all for coming. Thank you to Diane and Fagas and our techies in this event. They have done a lot of work uh, behind the scenes. And thank you also to a lot of people who have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Thank you to Lucy, I'm looking at you. Robin, I'm looking at you also. Wendy, I'm looking at you. Thank you for your uh, work behind the scenes. This event would not have been a success without you. And thank you to all and bye.